visa and loans companies. And we also have Mr. Godfrey Kujo with the Financial Stability Department of the Bank of Ghana. These are seasoned speakers who have been speaking more on financial literacy. And they are also very familiar with the terrain, the financial sector terrain in Ghana. And today we are, we are privileged to be, having, to be having them join us and talking to us about financial literacy, how to plan for our savings, our investments, and how to also look out for Ponzi schemes. By way of background, as we are all aware, with the Mark recent... Away. Hello, Linda, please, can you mute anyone that joins the meeting? I'm using my phone now, so... Okay. That's the answer. Okay. All right, I think everyone you. is on mute now, yeah. All right, so as we are all aware, between 2017 and 2019, or from 2017 till now, if I'm to say, put it that way, government has embarked on a series of financial cleanup exercises to clean our sector of illiquid and fraudulent financial sector players. Like if I'm to put it that way, not all of them are fraudulent anyway, but some, their operations actually had the resemblance of a Ponzi scheme. Most of us, as youthful as we are, adventurous as we are, we are more interested in investing for interest, investing for uh, returns, regardless of how huge it is, we, we, we are most often interested in how much we are going to earn from our investment. We therefore, as a result, do not look at the red flags that some of these investment products or investment companies pose to us. It is therefore important. It, it is based on this that we had a lot of Ponzi scheme operations or Ponzi scheme companies operating in Ghana, for instance, the DKM operations. We also know of God is love. Recently, of which we are all familiar with, we also know of men's gold operations. But the thing is, what makes these people Ponzi schemes? We have today Mr. Trinibu Akodia who will do as the honors by explaining to us what a Ponzi scheme looks like, how to know them or to identify them, and how to avoid them. If they are Ponzi scheme operations, then they are real and good investment schemes. How then do we identify these good investment schemes? I.e., how do we invest? How do we even save? If we intend or decide to save or invest, what are the institutions or the options available for us? So today we'll be having Mr. Trinibu Akudia, who will be doing us the honors, and we're explaining all these things to us to the benefit of us all. Away from that, when we invest or when we save, there are often times where we have challenges with our financial sector institution or our financial institution, the institution involved. There are times where you go to an institution, you want to make withdrawal or so, and you have challenges. What are the mechanisms available for you? What are the systems available for you to explore to make sure that you get the right treatment or the best treatment from your financial institution? We'll be having Mr. Godfrey Kujo from the Financial Stability Department of Bank of Ghana to explain those issues more to us and for us to have a better understanding of, of, of the processes and the mechanisms involved in, 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 in saving in Ghana. Um, Linda, if you can help us by running us through the program outline and then we'll quickly go ahead and kick off by um, and I'm taking activities. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, Emmanuel. The agenda for today, uh, we are going to start with the opening prayer. We'll have self-introductions, Purpose of Garden by Mr. Moses Kofi. The presentations will follow, and then we'll have question and answer tag. We'll end the program with um, some of your key takeaways, closing remarks, and vote of thanks from EPL reps. So without wasting much time, we will invite our incoming president, who will definitely one day oversee all such equations, financial policy schemes and all that, Miss Esther Emanuela Spiel, to give us the opening prayer for today. Thank you very much, Linda. Please shall we pray? 
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for another opportunity as this to be educated and to learn. We commit our activity this afternoon into your hands. We thank you that, Father, it has been a wonderful learning experience and we've been able to gain more insights on how to invest rightly to the glory of your name. Thank you very much for hearing us and for being with us as always. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Okay, so before we do the self-introduction, uh, Linda, we can hear you. If you are speaking, we can't hear you. Um, I think she's off. Okay. Hello, can you hear me yeah, now? Yeah, go ahead. You are in, okay, so you. before we begin the self-introduction, that is going to be way of what you expect from today's webinar. Before we do that, I'm seeing some new names here, far from our alumni and then EPL fellows. I know Mr. Kofi is on the line. Mr. Kofi, if you are here, you are welcome. I know our facilitators for today are also on the line. I'm seeing my ex-supervisor, Mr. Yeah. Kofiga. I also saw Madam Elizabeth Obey on the line. We want to say you are all welcome. I'll hand over to Emmanuel to help us with the expectations for today's program. Thank you very much, Linda. So I think quickly, um, I gave the background and an introduction and as to what has really necessitated this webinar. So we'll just go around and pick five, five people and let us hear their expectations for, uh, for today's program. So it's going to be as random, right? It's going to be as random. So we start with Kellen. Kellen, if you can hear us, kindly unmute and let us know your expectations for this program. All right, so Prosper. Right, Mr. Saki, I'm here with you. All right, please let us know your expectations. Right, so um, for me, financial, I am gunning for financial independence. And so um, this program is very timely for me. Expect to understand um, how I can go about my saving culture in fact, I, I need to save as, as an individual, as a young man. I want the um, experts we have on this call to help me understand what I need to do, what I need to do in order to achieve such financial independence. Um, some of the instruments I need to look out for if I'm investing, putting my money and where not to put in my money. So I expect to know all these things at the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Prosper. So you are expecting that at the end of this today's session, you will understand or you know how to save to achieve financial independence. That's a laudable one. Exactly. Dedo, Dedo, if you can hear us, can you unmute and let us know your expectations? Okay, so maybe we can do Esther, Esther Spio. Okay, thank you, Imano Saki. As rightly stated by Prosper, I'm also curious to know the signs or the triggers to look out for as far as Ponzi schemes are concerned. So those are some of the things that I'm hoping to hear so that I'll be able to invest rightly and not um, be a prey to some of these um, um, how do I call it? Bad investments. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the triggers for Ponzi scheme operations, what are the things you need to look out for? I think I will take the last one, the last expectations from, I think this I'm going to the other court. George. George, if you can hear us, please kindly unmute and let us know your expectations. How about Jennifer? Jennifer, can you hear me? Hello. 
Hi, Imano, thanks a lot. Um, so I'm here today to learn more about how to identify Ponzi schemes and probably how to avoid it. Um, and also to learn more about financial inclusion. Awesome, awesome. So I think the only thing you added to Esther's expectations is how to avoid them. And looking out for them, knowing them is your first step towards avoiding them. That, that, that's awesome. And then I think personal finance also has a direct relationship with financial inclusion. So indeed, we are all in the right forum. And Linda, if you are, you can hear me, kindly take over and let's introduce our, 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 our Mr. Kofi for the opening remarks. Okay, thank you, Emmanuel. Before Mr. Kofi gives his remarks, we would like our president, the president of the Emerging Public Leaders Alumni Network, Mr. Johnson Masagunti Singer, to give us the welcome address. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Johnson. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, everyone, you are welcome to our first um, webinar series. Mr. Moses Kofi, Country Director of Emerging Public Leaders Ghana. Mr. Tunibu Akodia, Executive Secretary of Ghana Associations of Savings and Loans Companies. Mr. Godfrey Kujo, the Financial Stability Department of Bank of Ghana. Madam Elizabeth from OACS, uh, representatives and fellows of uh, Liberia and Kenya of uh, Emerging Public Leaders, IPLAN members and executives, fellows, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon once again. It is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to the Emerging Public Leaders Alumni Network webinar series the financial literacy component of the webinar series. Emerging Public Leaders Alumni Network was inaugurated in 2020 with a vision of being a network of ethical public servants who are committed to excellence and act as catalysts for driving systemic change in Africa's public sector. A plan was formed from its mother organization, Emerging Public Leaders Program Ghana. Currently, uh, we have a membership size of about 40 members consisting of uh, the first and second cohorts of the Emerging Public Leaders Fellowship Program in Ghana. As part of efforts to provide members and the public with relevant information of interest through events and initiatives that are aimed at career and professional development, knowledge sharing and experience, and networking among members, ePlan is happy to launch and begin its online webinar series. And this is the financial literacy component of the webinar series. The webinar series is a platform to discuss and enlighten its members and the public on key topical areas that has the potential of driving change and the way people serve the public and thus developing Ghana and Africa at large. Despite the education by government to the public against fraudulent investment, many customers continue to transact business with some scrupulous and unlicensed institution offering fraudulent investment and savings products. Most of these products have the nature of Ponzi schemes which does not inure to the benefit of the customer. The purpose of this financial literacy program is to equip plan members, EPL fellows, and the public with relevant information yeah. to enable them manage their own personal finances, understand the modus operandi of Ponzi schemes, information and operations, and plan their personal finances in a way that best meets their unique needs. Our seasoned speakers are well vested and with their expertise, you can bring we are the... sure that the session will be very educative and it will help us to understand some of these areas and answer the questions that triggers our mind in, in, in the areas of investment. 
I wish everyone the best of interaction and the session will be successful. Thank you once again, and you are all welcome to EPLAN webinar series. Thank you, back to you, Linda. Thank you, Mr. President. I would want to acknowledge the presence of our executive director, Mrs. Yawa Hansen Kwao. She just joined us. We'll now hand over to our executive, our country director, Mr. Moses Covington, as the opening remarks for today's program. Good afternoon to you all. It's a real pleasure for me to be part of this event. About four years ago this time, the seeds were being sown for the best of emerging public leaders, Ghana. And today, four years down the line, it is very heartwarming to see how far we have come. Like Mr. President said, EPLAN, which is the name for the EPL Alumni Association, was formally inaugurated two years ago. And that was because that was the occasion of the graduation of our first cohort from this program. And therefore, they became the pioneer members of this alumni association. And the Alumni Association was set up for a number of, uh, to achieve a number of uh, purposes, some of which included to nurture growth and their professional growth among themselves. And also to raise and highlight issues of pertinent nature to the growth of this country and to lead a discourse on these towards helping educate and correct, if you like, wrong mindset about these issues. And so for me, it is indeed a real pleasure that this is the first of many, many activities that the E-Plan is going to be under, uh, undertaking. And it being the first of their webinar series, I'm also excited about the, the topics that they have selected for a number of reasons. I recall, I think around age 40 or so, I listened to a radio discussion about uh, financial literacy. And a young lady of about 24 or so, I, I think she was in a final year university or had just finished university, was brought on the program to share her personal experience. And her personal experience was to the effect that she actually lives off the profits of her investment and that the principal remains untouched because she, has, she had engaged in some business, I mean, based on the head national skills that were yielding some profit. And she had invested monies into various instruments. And as she spoke about the fact that she was only living off profit to travel, to do stuff, I felt so silly. <laughs> because at that age, around 40, I, I, at the time, I, I don't think I could boast of investment, all right? And it, you know, when, many, many people live from hand to mouth, especially when you're in a salary job. But I do remember it also this day. And I think that that particular uh, sharing or testimony for me set, if you like, a new course for me in my life on taking financial literary, uh, literary literacy serious. I'm also happy about the fact that this kind of education is being done and the majority of uh, the target audience are young people. Because if you take these things serious, by the time you get to 40, 50, you would be a millionaire and people wouldn't understand yeah. it. But it just yeah, was educated. All it needed was for you to be educated along the right line and to practice what you had been taught. And so kudos to the ePlan executive and the whole alumni association for the step that they have taken. We look forward to a lot more of such uh, activities, not only webinars, but also other activities where they serve to be leaders of advocacy, all right, for change in pertinent issues that affect this nation. It has also been a very painful experience to see and hear of family members who fell prey to recent uh, Ponzi schemes that we have known in this country. Fortunately, I have not been falling prey to any of these, 
But I do know people who have fallen prey to this, and it is painful. Money is that you, you have struggled, you have actually sought to, to make, only ending up in the arms, hands of people who had very bad intention, or wicked intention, all right, for the investments that they entered into. And therefore, I dare say that this education is necessary, a very, very necessary thing for the majority of our population, because those who have come to understand the difficulties of not saving have now taken upon themselves this new, new attitude and new, so this new behavior or this of, of, of saving only to be defrauded, all right, by people who had wicked intentions. And so it is important for us to be able to know the signs and the flags to stay away from, because it's not every, things are, are not necessarily the way they seem. And, and one of the lessons I've learned in life is that if it is too good to be true, be careful, especially when it has to do with an investment. And so as uh, the country director for Emerging Public Leaders, I'm again excited and honored to be part of this uh, particular ceremony or event, and also to see the last pillar of our six pillars in the EPL uh, program uh, module, all right, the sixth component, which is uh, actually supporting alumni and uh, or enhancing alumni uh, growth and so on, coming into fruition with this activity. Let us look out for many more activities that he plan, plan, uh, has in mind for the rest of the year and for subsequent years. I encourage you to pay attention and to take full advantage of today's webinar because I can promise you to do you a world of good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Moses Kofi. And you, I must say you are very lucky you haven't fallen into such schemes before we have the likes of Chai Mall and Loom that a lot of university students chanced on. Unfortunately, I fell into one and today I'm glad we are learning much about these things. So I'll just move on and then introduce our first facilitator for today, Mr. Chinebu Akudia Boache. Mr. Chinebu Akudia Boache is the executive secretary of the Ghana Association of Savings and Loans Company as of September 2017. Mr. Boache is in charge of the day-to-day -day administration and serves as the key spokesperson for the association. He is engaged in advocacy, policy formulation, and all relevant stakeholder engagement as far as the association and savings and loan sector is concerned. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Boache was executive director at Inkoswo Microfinance Limited, a company he co-founded and managed for seven years in Accra, Ghana. He was also the Southern Sector President of the Ghana Association of Microfinance Company, overseeing five regions and also a national board member of the association. Mr. Chinebua Boache is very passionate about organizational and regulatory compliance within the financial sector. He's an experienced corporate and private administrator with strong interpersonal problem solving and communication skills. His interests include enhancing compliance to internal controls, credit risk, management, and investment. He has attended and facilitated a number of workshops, seminars, and conferences on microfinance, advocacy, regulatory compliance, curriculum development, negotiations, anti-money laundering, and many other topics covering the financial sector, both locally and internationally. And I must say, we are very honored to have Mr. Chinebu Abuache in our midst today to take us through policy schemes, investments, savings, and the operations of all such. Mr. Abuache, if you are here, we want to say you are welcome and you may take over from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and have a good afternoon. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Great, 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 great. And I'm excited to be part of this program, and um, I'm very grateful to the leadership and to everyone here for making time to be here and also for the invitation. 
today we're going to look at some of the things affecting our lives and I cannot wait to hear your various remarks and I was actually happy with the various expectations that uh, we have coming into this particular program. Today, we are going to look at the financial sector of Ghana. And globally, if you look at any financial sector, this is how it looks like, who are some of the stakeholders. And then you look at the product and services that you are going to have with these financial institutions. Then we will look at financial planning. Why savings or investing? Why do I need to save? And why do I need to invest? Are the two the same, actually? Then what are some of the pointers or red flags for spotting a Ponzi scheme? So you do not fall prey before you realize that, had I known. And I like um, one of the statements that I think our uh, one of us said that if it is true to be good, or if it is good to be true, then it is. It is what? Then you should be asking yourself a number of questions. If you look at Ghana, and generally in our financial sector, you will realize that there are a lot of stakeholders that play uh, critical roles. And one of them is the judicial system. If a nation's judicial system is not up to notch, if the, the judicial system is not good to understand the market, you will realize that a lot of cases will go into these courts and they will be delaying a lot of things. But we must also be careful that the judiciary cannot rush into giving judgment because we say that the wheel of justice grinds slowly. The rationale is also the fact that, yes, you are wishing that somebody should be prosecuted on time or early, but don't forget that that same person is the father or mother or sister or brother or a cousin of somebody who is here. And therefore, we do not wish that uh, injustices should prevail, but we expect an efficient justice system. You would also look at other development partners in Ghana here, for instance, the World Bank currently is supporting the government of Ghana to roll out a number of programs in educating the public, they support other stakeholders. You also look at the role of academia and research institutions. You also play critical role such that if you know exactly what the market is, you will go out there and educate people about it. If when I was a student, I could receive some speakers to build my interest. Actually, I got interested in the financial sector when I was in the university. And this has continued and so helped me to get a lot of interest and passion to know more and to do better. And so if we are able to play our role, just as the media plays its role, those of you who have the opportunity to go into the media space, the, the print media, the, 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 the airwaves, those online, those of you can blog. We, I want to encourage you that this is the time for you to blog more on the good things about the sector. Again, this is the time that you can also blog more about educating other people, reaching out to a lot of people to read good stories that will enrich their lives. There are a lot of stories you go online, you read, and you realize that it adds no value to our lives. But unfortunately, the youth of today, we prefer reading those stories than actually reading the ones that will enrich us. You realize that the government also has a role to play in all these things. Therefore, the government comes out with policies to make sure that the right framework is uh, developed and implemented. When the sector is not doing well, people quickly look at the government, but you realize that the government can do a certain extent. 
there are other key players who need to play their role. Who are they? They're regulators. In Ghana, there are four key regulators in the financial sector. And I'm going to elaborate on that area. They, they, they are the financial institutions that come under these regulators in the financial sector. If we know these financial institutions, if we know their regulators, then you will not fall prey to any of the scammers. And you will know what exactly. The last group that we normally forget is the customer, you. If you play your role, if you know what is right, if you take the right decisions, these people will not get you. But unfortunately, the one who brought about this Ponzi scheme, he says something and his statement has always rang in my ears. He says that Ponzi schemes can never be eliminated from the face of this earth. So regulators and people should forget about this fight. And he gives two reasons. He says that so long as there is poverty and there is greed, then they will not be eliminated. And I turn out to agree with him. There are some people who go in there because they are poor, but there are some people, they are also very rich, but they are greedy. And unfortunately, those who are normally caught up within this web are the last, the, the last group, the latter, the rich who are greedy. I must say, anyone who is caught up in a scam is greedy. I say it with no apologies. And let this be the turning point. I am also not saying don't take risk. Failure to take risk is a risk by itself. In Ghana, the financial sector is developed into four or uh, partitioned into four uh, areas. You have those that are controlled by the Bank of Ghana. So when you go into any financial institution, you should ask yourself, are you regulated by the Bank of Ghana, the Pensions Regulatory Authority, National Insurance Commission or the Securities and Exchange Commission. Any institution that is outside these four is not a financial institution in Ghana. And I say it again, in Ghana, any institution that is not regulated by any of these institutions here is not a financial institution and you are not supposed to actually give them money for returns. Of course, there is an opportunity given to companies who are registered under the Companies Act, who the Companies Act permits them that by their nature and design, you can lend them monies and therefore you become like a debenture holder. And when you become a debenture holder, they are supposed to even give you certain certificates with the conditions. You can also secretly go into any private institution and go and buy shares there. That's on your own. But if you want to publicly trade, you want to publicly own shares, then you need to go through the Securities and Exchange Commission. So, if you are reading on your phone, you may find it a bit, um, very small characters. But let me take the, uh, the pain to go through this chat with you. In Ghana, as I said earlier, we have the Bank of Ghana regulated institutions. And the Bank of Ghana regulated institutions and all the other institutions in Ghana who are the financial institution, we can categorize them into deposit-taking institution and non-deposit-taking institution. So if an institution tells you that I am taking your deposit, you should ask yourself, are they permitted to take deposit or they are not permitted to take deposit? So if you are permitted to take deposit, then you are under Bank of Ghana. 
Now, those that are permitted to take deposits and the Bank of Ghana, please take note, and the Bank of Ghana, we have the banks. You have savings and loans companies. You have finance houses. You have microfinance companies. Please take note of how I am mentioning the names. And then you have rural and community banks. Commercial banks, as we know, or the universal banks, their capital is 400 million Ghana city. Savings and loans and finance houses, the current capital is 15 million minimum. Microfinance companies, they are required to have a minimum capital of 2 million Ghana cities. And rural banks are required to have a capital of 1 million Ghana cities. These are very clear institutions. Apart from them, there are other three institutions that you may deal with who are individually owned or a group. You have the credit unions, and I'm sure you have heard a lot about credit union. You may have one in your, your, your church, in your town, or your area, or other places. Then we have individual money lenders. We call them microcredit enterprises. They also grant loans. But mind you, they do not take savings or deposit. Those who are enterprises called the microcredit are not permitted to take your money. What actually they can do is that when they are giving you loan, they will normally say that bring some money. We call it cash collateral. So when you take your, you give them your cash collateral, you give them the cash, maybe they are giving you say 30% should be deposited with us. The law is that those cash collateral they have taken, they cannot trade with it. They are supposed to put it into an escrow account. The very day you finish paying your loan, they should give you all that money. If that institutions tell you that, oh, keep that money with us, please it's against the law. I am bringing all these things out because you remember I said the stakeholders include the customer. If we will have a better uh, market, we will have better financial system, the customer plays a key role in all these things. Then you come to those who do not take deposits. A leasing company does not take a deposit. Mortgage companies, microcredit companies, financial NGOs, remittances, forest bureaus, credit reference. All these institutions are regulated by Bank of Ghana, but they do not take deposits. So don't take your deposit there. Apart from the commercial bank, do not also take your foreign currency to any of the institutions I've mentioned, except when you are going to change your foreign currency with the Forest Bureau. If you send your money to any of them, a savings loan, a microfinance, rural bank, whatever, and that institution goes down, please, your money is lost forever. You have no protection under the law. That owner will be prosecuted. It's a criminal offense, having done something against the law. They will be prosecuted, but your money will be lost. The next thing is the capital markets. The capital market is regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the Securities and Exchange Commission, their members or the institutions under them include the stock exchange, investment advisors or brokers, and we have fund management companies. We know what the stock exchange does. We have one in Ghana, and the fund management companies, they do not take deposit. Please take it from me. They rather take our money on what we call into investment schemes. So they do not promise a return. Please, any fund manager that will tell you that if you bring money here, I will give you X percentage is a scam. Because that is not what the law says. Fund management companies, they take our monies. There are two things they do. One is that we don't know how to manage our own money. We don't know where to, to put the investment. So we go to them and they advise us, take our monies and advise us and put it into 
one investment that has a lot of regulations, restrictions, where they can invest, where they cannot invest. They cannot promise you a return. What they can do is that they will tell you that our history tells us that over the years, we are always doing plus two of treasury bill, or we are always doing better than treasury bill, but they cannot give you a certificate and promise you an interest rate on it. So do not be confused with them. Then you have the insurance companies. As insurance, I need not retreat. You can use the insurance to manage your risk. You can use insurance to do a lot of things. We have the general, the life, the brokers, and also the reinsurance. Then we have pensions. Under the pensions, we have the three-tier pension scheme. We have the tier one that is compulsory, and that is formal. Also, SNIT is bringing up a lot of informal also, so that those who are not in formal employment can also do that. But the tier two and tier three are managed by private companies or corporate trustees. And these corporate trustees are licensed by the central, uh, by the MPRA. These are the institutions and the Bank of Ghana that you can send your money to. Please take note. Those that you can send your money to. We call them banks and specialized deposit taking institutions. They are the banks, savings and loans, finance houses, microfinance companies, and rural banks. There's a CIS one that is the SUSU collectors. They are regulated by Bank of Ghana but they take only susu. We all know what susu is about. Not that keep my money with me for three months and I will take with interest. No, susu do not pay interest. So any institution that tell you that we are a susu, we are doing susu, we will give you interest. Please, it's a scam. What are some of the products that we can have when doing business with any of these banking institutions? who come out to tell us we are a financial institution, we are a banking institution. They generally do four things, deposits. They take your money and then they grant loans out of that money. Or they take your money, grant loans, and then do other investments with your money. And all these other investments they do with your money and the loans is shown on the face of their balance sheet. So you see their balance sheet and you see the percentage of deposit they have taken to the loans they have granted and also the deposit, uh, the investment or the placements they have made. You have seen that a, a kind of loan that they can also give is a guarantee and I've given a story. It is only the commercial banks or the investor bank that can give guarantees. So you go to a savings and loan company and say, we are giving you guarantee or credit guarantee, please. You should be knowing that you are helping them to perpetuate some illegalities. They also offer other financial services such as checks. And in Ghana, commercial banks, savings and loans, and rural banks issue checking accounts. We also offer remittances, transfer, mobile, and electronic banking, among others. These financial institutions also provide business and personal finance ideas or decision making. So they also help us to plan. Now, look at this. Would you want to be on the left or you want to be on the right? Would you want to be able to say that I own this or I live here or I can go on holiday or I can do something? Yesterday, this for laughter, I heard this audio by a uh, video by um, this man of God, is Hudanaba. He says that when you get money, chop some. Say when you get money, chop some. There are some of you. It's difficult even getting the money. How will you chop? Uh, it's good to chop some money when you have good money. Make sure it is a good money. It's not every money that is choppable. How do you get the results you are looking for? There are certain decisions you need to make. 
you can save. Saving is putting some money aside for short-term purposes. Mind you, it's for short-term purposes. Putting some assets, that is funds or money, or it could be any other thing. Don't forget that there are some people, when they get their money today, they go and uh, buy blocks. It means you are saving in terms of blocks. But don't forget that these blocks, if you don't keep them well too, the rains will wipe them off. There are some people when they get the money, they will buy land. Land is a long-term investment. And therefore you move into investment. You can open an account and it is ideal that everybody, you have an operating account and a savings account. This savings, savings account should, and I will encourage you, not be what is closer to you. There are some of us, we have a savings account. We say we are doing savings, but we have ATM on that savings account. You have opened that savings account at the a branch that is behind your house. I have opened my savings account that it is difficult for me to go there. I don't have a checkbook on that account. I don't have an ATM on that account. And I put the instruction on it that if I need money, I should come there and give them notice. So that it makes it difficult for me myself to even take money from there. We build into that savings account so that you move it into investment. It's not easy acquiring certain things. And let me tell you what, those of you who have had the opportunity of certain investment, you realize that if you had money at that time, you would have gotten a certain laptop cheaper. If you had money at a certain time, you realize that you would have gotten a certain land cheaper. About 10 years ago, I lost the opportunity of acquiring a five bedroom house. If it were to be today, I would have acquired it. I didn't have money. And I didn't have the the capacity to also go and borrow that money. Long term goes into investment. And those in Ghana that help us to do an investment in the financial market, we do the Bank of Ghana. You can look at the SEC and the MPRE regulated institutions. You can also manage your risk using insurance. Please, those Would of you who are not interested in buying insurance, I will encourage you to do so. You can ensure the house, the content that you have. You are not rent, you are not living in your own house. Where you are staying, that content, you can invest, uh, insure it. You can buy the National Health Insurance scheme. Please enroll on it. There are some of us, we think that that one is key not. You go, they'll give you only para. Hey, my friend. The very day that they will carry you to a certain facility that it is only the National Health Insurance that will save you. Tell you, I had, um, I had to send one of my boys, my children, to a certain hospital in Ghana here, a big hospital, and the only thing they take is National Health Insurance. The only thing they take. If you don't have an insurance, health insurance, they will tell you, join this line. And that one takes a lot of years. What are some of the options? Short term, long term, we have looked at it. You can go to a regulated institution by Bank of Ghana. They have what we call money market instruments. Those that are under the Securities and Exchange Commission, they have what we call long term investment. And that one, they have is called the capital market. You can buy bonds, you can buy shares, you can invest in mutual funds. And of course, you can also buy pensions. There are a lot of pension uh, products on the market, which I will encourage you. I have signed on to about three of the pension products. Every month, I pay 100 Ghana CD. 100 Ghana CD. The last time I checked, I can tell you, I had 7,000 in my savings 
and 7,000 in my pension. Because this particular product, they separate it from, they, they do the savings and pension. And it is on the MTN portal. Those of you who have seen it, the star 170, you can go there. Start small. Why do I need to invest? Or why do I need to save, actually? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, it will help you to deal with the risk of life. There are certain risks of life that whatever the case may be, it will come. Somebody will die. You will get hurt one day. There'll be an accident. There'll be a time you cannot go out and do your runnings to get that 20 cities or 40 cities. Or you may be laid off. It gives you investment opportunities. I have not mentioned that it happened to me. Actually, there was about six years ago too, there was a property um, at a place that they said, oh, TK, you can uh, uh, pay 15,000 for it. That time I did not have 15,000. Today, five years ago, today that, that land is worth 40,000. Our land is worth 40,000. There are some of you who will lose a lot of opportunities because you don't have any opportunities prepared for you. It helps you to have better life, gives you opportunity to even get credit. Let me tell you, those of us in the financial market in credit delivery, they will look at your credit history and your savings culture. They will look at how you are running your savings account before they even grant you loans, except those that are tied directly to your salary. That one they call salary loans. As for that one, they know so long as you take salary, they will pay. It will help you to avoid the, the issue of over-dependence on others. It will also make you, um, help you to deal with different life choices. Actually, there are some of you, your relationships have gone down or you've gotten broken down relationship because the person asked you for some money and genuinely you didn't have and therefore you lost that relationship. You are not even happy going to certain places because you don't have the opportunity. What is the ideal time to start investing? This time is now. When you, they give you windfall, there are some of you, somebody meets you in the corridor and he gives you 50 Ghana CDs. And that day, that 50 Ghana CD, not that you, you don't have money, but because you think it was a windfall, that money will vamoose. You will spend it. There are some of you at the end of the year, you get some bonus. Please direct all your bonus into something productive. Please don't let bonus be part of your regular spending. Anytime you get a win for, please and please use it to do something that you will be happy and proud of using the money for. It could be that you immediately get that win for and roll in a certain course to build your capacity. Yes, build your capacity. Have you seen this uh, WhatsApp messages on your phones before? Hello everyone on this honorable platform. Please, I know a lot of people have tried online business transactions and it doesn't work, but I'm recommending Mr. Nathan of Bitcash Investment, the best and safe source. You see what he said, safe source. Really? Invest 250 Ghana and get 2,500. Invest 5,000 and get 50,000. Then the government of Ghana will go and invest our 1 billion so that we get 50 billion to support our budget. Why don't those people talk to the government? They help the government. Please. This is a scam. Then they will send you this payment received. And this is very genuine. And you see that. It is mobile money. 
how do they do it? Very simple. So I will recruit somebody. So you see, it starts from the top. So TK is at the top here. I'll get two people. And then if you bring thousand, so I will go and actually actually borrow two thousand from or say five thousand. I'll go and borrow five thousand. So if you bring thousand, I'll give you two thousand. So how? Immediately this brings five thousand. I will give him his thousand plus one of my thousand, one of my five thousand. And this person too, I will give him his thousand and my thousand. So what have left me actually is 2000. So they will go and bring 2000 from here to me. And this one will also bring 2000 to me. So now I have 4000. This 4000, I will tell this one, you have six months, this is three months. So I will pay this person, I'll pay this person. This person will be more encouraged to go and bring more people. So he will go and bring more people. So at the end of the day, the base enlarges. Now, the reality is that under Ponzi schemes, there is no underlining asset that they use the money for. There is no underlining assets. So why do they collapse? They collapse because of what I've just said, that the base depends on new recruits. If they don't get continuous flow of funds, then the scheme will crash. So what are some of the red flags? Do I know that this is a Ponzi scheme? They normally promise high investment returns with little or no risk. Mind you, they will tell you that, oh, you don't need to do anything, only bring the money. We have been taught in school, Economics 101, that risk and returns are directly proportional. And this is what I used to tell people. If you are on the first floor of a story building and somebody goes to the fifth floor, and the two of them are to jump down when there is fire. Who will survive? Definitely the person on the first floor will survive more than or has the chances of surviving more than the person on the fifth floor. Why? Because of the highest level. He wants more returns, more re interest. So even if the institution is registered by Bank of Ghana, is registered by whatever, and they say, we will give you high interest rates. Please run for your life. All the institutions that were doing advert on high interest rates, we do not see them anymore. They are overly consistent returns. Immediately you invest, you get the money. You invest, you get the money. And that is how it runs. Ask yourself, what will this money be used for so that I will get that returns they are telling me I will get? A quick check is that financial institutions like the deposit taking institutions in Ghana, the banks and the SDIs I've mentioned, they do times two or maximum times three of your investment rates to grant loans. What do I mean? If they give you interest on your deposit, because it is your deposit they will use to grant the loans, and I've said it already. If they give you interest of 15%, they will be granting a loan of times three. That is 45%. But if somebody tells you that I will give you times 10, ask yourself, will you take a loan of times 10 
please, anybody who comes to you and say that, oh, bring this money, even if it is a bank or a savings loan or a rural bank or microfinance, any institution, that tells you that, oh, you bring your investment at uh, uh, 30%. Ask yourself, if they take the 30 percent, if you give them that investment of 30 percent, because you are chasing for a higher interest, will you be willing to pay a loan that is times three of your rate? Will you pay a loan of 90 percent? If you will not pay a loan of 90 percent, then note that they will go and give that one as a loan, and that person will not pay. So your money will lock down or will lock up. These Ponzi schemes, they do not have any underlying assets and they are normally not registered. And they are so secretive. They will tell you that, oh, we have our strategies of doing it. Any institution that you give them your money and they cannot openly tell you where they invest their money to get that returns, Please, it's a, a scam. Even if you it is named TK Savings and Loans, and you ask them this money, what will you be using it for? And they say, oh, it is our trade secret. Please, it is a scam. Because they are supposed to disclose what they are using our money for. And those people, they are normally issue with paperwork, few paperwork, and difficult in receiving payments. How do I make the right choice as I wrap up? Assess your investment objectives. Why and how long do you want to make this investment? What is your risk appetite? What kind of returns are you expecting? Your whole portfolio, you have 10,000 or you have 200 Ghana. How much of it can you allocate to one particular institution? Please don't put all your eggs in one basket. Visit the financial institution or any financial institution of your choice. Do not be coerced by what your friends are telling you that, oh, as for this place, they are best. Please verify it yourself. Compare the terms of the investment between financial institutions, as well as your own objectives that you have set. Please, again, do not chase high returns. Find out what you can, if it is possible, about the financial institution. If you have access to their financial statement, please, the better. Check their websites. A lot of these scammers, their website, you go there, you won't find any information on their performance. You won't even find even the people behind them. Seek expert advice. And when the returns being offered is too high above the market rate, I am not saying that don't go for high interest rate, but if it is too high above the peers, if a particular, the whole banking sector, investor banks, everybody is offering 15, 16, 17, and this particular bank say we are offering 22, then you should know that they are in cash, they, they need cash. So please, pay yourself, create a spending pattern, spend less than you earn, distinguish your needs from your wants, establish an emergency fund, and I've mentioned about it, borrow wisely. There are some of you who have borrowed but you are not paying your loans. Please, it's not good at all. Morally, it's bad. You are also part of the people who last in the financial sector. Those of you who are not paying your loans, if you have a difficulty in paying your loan, go to the financial institution first. Don't let them chase you. Automate your savings or investment deposit and don't work too hard. Let your money work for you at a certain point because investment is a lifestyle. Don't be too wise to be the first person to hit the jackpot of a scam. Has come, everybody is chasing to so you too. You want to chase it. Thank you very much, and hope to see you once again. Thank you, Mr. Chinebua Boache.
that was an insightful presentation and I have learned a lot, a lot from this. My few takeaways for this particular presentation are that Ponzi schemes cannot be eliminated so long as there is poverty and there is greed. If you decide not to take risk, <laughs> then it's a failure in itself. So, but then you should take risk wisely. Before venturing into any investment portfolio or whatsoever, we should try to assess our investment objectives and seek expert advice. If we need those expert advice, we'll run back to you for them. Thank you so much, Mr. Boache. At this point, we'll give room for questions. <laughs> Hello. Linda, I can see a hand up. This mark, I'm a fianu. Okay, your question, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, sir, for the, the presentation. It was very insightful and very, very, very revealing. I have a few clarifications that I would like you to uh, make for us. Um, you mentioned that uh, Ponzi schemes and those who operate do not have uh, underlining uh, assets. I want you to elaborate on what an underlining asset is, why it is very relevant. And I also want to know, does the Bank of Ghana regulate interest levels to be paid on investment by uh, depositors? Uh, do they do it or is it their responsibility to even do it at all? I'm asking this because, for instance, if we hear of interest levels that are above, for instance, what is uh, it's normal at a point in time, should the Bank of Ghana raise an alert and maybe question that bank or anything of that kind at all to um, inform customers about the dangers for putting such a bank? And I'm thinking about that as a proactive approach. Does the Bank of Ghana do that or is it their responsibility at all? And I want to add the last one. If, say, uh, commercial banks that have, that are, um, um, legally registered under the Bank of Ghana and regulated in the unlikely event or if they collapse, will the Bank of Ghana or the government or reinsurers uh, refund savings to depositors? And if they do, why wouldn't the Bank of Ghana refund savings to um, let me say financial institutions that have been declared a Ponzi scheme whose monies have been locked up but were rightfully registered and, and were regulated by either SEC or any, or any of the four that you mentioned that are the ones in charge of the market. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Wacho will answer for Can us. I respond? Yes, please. Oh, okay. I thought we can take one more, then we can respond. Or I see Mr. Vasco. Yeah, Vasco. Please, we want you to mention your names and then your institution. Um, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Vasco Ayere Avoka, formerly of the Ministry of Health. Um, thank you. Mr. Chungerwa for the presentation. Uh, we talked about the deposit taking and the non-deposit taking um, institutions. So if I want to um, establish a business in the um, non-deposit taking sector of the of the investment, you know, um, industry that you spoke about, say maybe insurance, um, is there any uh, financial or minimum financial requirement that I'm supposed to have before I can do? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So let me take you from the last uh, question. Any kind of business that you want to do, I showed you the regulator responsible for that one. Please 
go to the regulator's office. Do not go through anybody. Go there yourself. And then ask the necessary questions. There are some of them that require a minimum paid up capital. There are some of them that you have to register with the Registrar General. Now, there are two different things you do at Registrar General. Either you register as a company or as an enterprise. So all these things, if you go to the Bank of Ghana or insurance or the SEC, they will tell you all the requirements. You can start from also their websites. They can also give you a lot of information on that one. Thank you very much. The first question, when we say an underlining asset, what we mean is that what the money they have collected, what they are using it for. You remember that when we did accounting 101, we say that asset is equal to capital plus liabilities. So for you to have the capital, your first, the money you are investing in the business, if it is your own money, is your capital. Then you will buy maybe a truck to start the business. While you start the business, you need more money from other people. And the money from other people is your liabilities. You buy more equipment. So you realize that you are building your assets. So the monies we have given to these institutions are supposed to be the liabilities for them. What assets did they use it for? And two, what instruments are they investing in to be able to pay us that returns? If you ask them and they do not give you the answer that convinces you, please run for your life. There are some of us too, it's not because of this question. There are some of us too that we have the idea that, oh, this one, I know it is a scam, pa, I know. But let me go in quickly and leave fast. A lot of people have that mentality. They go in and leave. The first one, they were successful. Second one, they were successful. You are part of the greedy people. And then the third one, you'll be caught. I know a lot of people who got their hands bent because of investing in this 10% monthly interest. Will you take a loan of 10% a month? If you will not take, then know that the money that is going in there will not come. So that is what we mean by underlining assets. Does BOG regulate interest rates? No, BOG doesn't regulate. And Ghana is not interested in regulating interest rates. The only thing that the central bank can do is to encourage financial institutions. But know what? This interest rate comes, it starts from we, the customers. This interest rate, the high interest rate, come from we, the customers. If we all from today decide that we will take our money to an institution that offers us a lower rate, their lower rate, that institution will also grant lower rates on loans, and businesses will grow. But because we, you and I, we are so greedy, we are looking for high interest rate on our deposit. We will also be asked to pay higher interest rates on loans. So that is where you start from. And also the inefficiency in our operations. If we all become efficient as good citizens in our workplaces, in our banking institutions, we will be able to cut off some of the inefficiencies. There is a deposit protection. We call it now, Ghana has a, a Ghana Deposit Protection uh, uh, Scheme in place. What does it do? It is for only, please take note. It is for only 
the institutions that I mentioned as SDIs and banks. Those who are in the bank, uh, you remember I showed you the slide on banks and then SDIs. We are the only ones with under the deposit protection scheme. And this one, when that institution goes down, the deposit scheme will pay you a certain amount, a certain amount under the scheme. Those that are not under the scheme, you have to go through the process by the Companies Act. Liquidation, when we liquidate the assets, then they will pay you uh, what you can get. You said that, I think I didn't get that one uh, uh, accurately, the last question that, what about the institutions who had licenses and they got their monies locked up? Why are, no, are they not getting their monies? In any case, please, there is no law in Ghana, please, and take it from here. There is no law in Ghana that says that when a financial institution goes down, government should give them money. There's no law. It's only a social contract. But the government thinks that if it had allowed the financial institutions to collapse or the, the way it was going, they could have killed the whole system. And mind you, the, the backbone of every economy is the financial sector. When people want to come and even open factories here, they have to send the money through a bank or a financial institution. They need to insure them. So if the institutions are not strong, then investors will have I hope this to you with answers our questions and concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Boache. Thank you very much. Because of time, please, if you do have any questions, do well to leave it in the chat box. Um, after we'll see to address it. All right, so thank you very much, Linda. Thank you, Mr. Chunibua Kodiabuachi for the insightful presentation. Um, we have a couple of comments from in the chat. Maybe I read it whilst, before we go on to Mr. Kofi Kujio. So we have here that from Joshua Angsinlari. He says, thank you very much for this financial education giving. You have indirectly given us money. God bless them. And we also have from Johnson Single that this is very educative. Thank you very much, Mr. Tunubu Akodia. We have Abet Ni, Abet Ani. He says, this is the most useful weekend for me. I've really learned a lot. Thank you very much. Please, we can leave our comments or we, any questions that we have with respect to Mr. Um, Tunubu Akodia's question, um, presentation. And we will do well to let him have it and we'll forward the responses to you uh, appropriately. Because of time, we will move on straight to the presentation of Mr. Godfrey Kujo. So Mr. Godfrey Kujo is with the Financial Stability Department of Bank of Ghana. He is with the Market Conduct Unit, and he had his bachelor's degree in computer engineering with the University of Pamukkama University of Tech and Tech, um, Science and Technology, and later had his master's in MBA in finance from the Coventry University. He has been with the Bank of Ghana since 2010 October. That's over 11 years in policy and 11 years in public service. That's awesome, given what EPL stands for and what EPL seeks to achieve, inspiring people to stay in public service. So without wasting much time, Mr. Kujo, if you are ready, please take over whilst we learn the recourse mechanism in the banks and SDI sector. Thank you so much.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and um, I'm very grateful this um, afternoon for having me to join you to share um, some ideas or um, have a discussion with you on um, our recourse mechanism. Um, and thanks so much, TK, for the wonderful presentation. I think it was very, very informative. Um, I think at a point I was learning myself from, from the presentation. So um, thank you very much once again. So briefly, uh, some of the issues I wanted to talk about, um, uh, TK has uh, done a very good job um, by going into detail to explain to you what uh, the entire financial system is. Um, I just wanted to add just a little to, um, I think uh, he, he also gave detailed um, explanation as to what all the individual institutions that are licensed by Bank of Ghana, uh, what they do. Um, just, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, yes, all right. So, good. I just wanted to emphasize this. TK mentioned the deposit taking institutions, uh, mentioned the non deposit taking institutions. Uh, just a little to add, um, especially with uh, microfinance institutions. Um, TK has mentioned that they take deposit. What it means is that if you have your money, you can go and then put it there. But just to highlight that when it comes to the microfinance institutions, we are looking at smaller deposits. So to the extent that we have even cut how much you can put uh, or you can deposit with the microfinance institutions. So, so that uh, we don't find ourselves sending huge sums of our monies to microfinance institutions. As the name goes, these are microfinance institutions. And so they may not have the the capacity to um, more or less accommodate large amount of money um, that a, a bank or a real bank can take. And so the, the cap is 5% of the of their paid up capital. So um, I think TK explained the paid up capital as well. Uh, if you are coming to set up a microfinance, Bank of Ghana will ask you to present uh, some uh, amount of money. Uh, in the, currently, they are required to maintain a capital of uh, 2 million Ghana cities. Um, so what it means is that if you're a microfinance institution, you are not supposed to take money from a customer um, that should, should not be more than 5% of the paid up capital. So in this case, 5% of the 2 million, that gives us about uh, 400,000 Ghana cities, if my calculation is right. Um, that's about 400,000 cities, yes. So we need to take note of that, that if you have any money that is beyond 400,000 uh, Ghana cities, then you are not supposed to send that money to a microfinance institution. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight on that as well. Okay, so now let me just quickly uh, run you through the recourse procedure. So as TK had rightly said, if consumers are not there, then of course we, our financial system would also not be there. In any case, all the struggles of um, the financial institutions are to provide a service to customers and so that they can also remain in business and remain profitable. So really, if you are not there, if customers are not there, they are not there. That is why um, we have always said, you know, those days, um, um, for those of you who have lived in very remote or rural areas, uh, the banking halls of uh, some of the banks uh, seem to be some high place that uh, only a few can even enter. Uh, to the extent that we even worship uh, in court, um, the tellers and then even the staff. So you see in town, you have somebody who works in the bank and uh, that person is quite is healed. Now, the point of this, um, gone are the days where, I mean, these notions are kept. To the extent that um, if, if a bank is giving you a loan, it's seen as the bank is doing you a favor. Or if you're going to deposit your money with a bank, it's seen as the bank doing, doing you a favor. But really, that's not how it is. Uh, it's you rather putting uh, food on your table. That is what it means. You are putting food on your table. If you don't send your deposit, they will not have any money to give out as loans for them to get their interest and uh, be able to pay their workers and then pay uh, their shareholders. So it means that a customer is very, very uh, important here. And that is why if you look at 
the Mark of Ghana uh, law that it's, it's, uh, we use to regulate the institutions, there's a clear mandate in that law um, that says that the Bank of Ghana should ensure that the interests of the consumer are well protected. Now, in trying to protect that uh, consumer right, what it means is that one of the things that Bank of Ghana should ensure or we try to do is that we know that um, a banking relationship cannot be entirely perfect, all right? Uh, in this case, customer, uh, banks are providing services to you. And any service, as usual, with any other service, there could be a time where there might be issues with them. So we need to provide some assurance to the customer that when you do any banking business with any savings and loans or microfinance or a bank and there are issues, BOG will be behind to provide some, uh, 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 some protection or more or less provide a medium for you to submit your complaint and have that confidence that your complaint will be held and not that uh, and have um, that notion that well, if you go and complain, nothing will be done. And so you just have to come to the market and sit home. Probably do not go ahead to do business. Okay. So this is um, the money that is provided to uh, Bank of Ghana. And so what Bank of Ghana has further done is that has designed or has developed a records procedure to say that every bank or every rural bank or every savings and loan follow these procedures in trying to get your complaints resolved. And so it is clear that every person or everyone, even whether you're a customer or non-customer, you have a right to complain or to submit a complaint to any of the regulated uh, financial institutions. And um, in the next presentation, I'll show you uh, the procedures for the, the process for submitting um, a complaint. Now, we have also made it clear that if you have any complaint, um, you, you are not going to be forced to provide your complaint in English. Okay, so the banks or the savings and loans or the financial institutions have been given uh, a strict um, um, directive that you need to receive the complaint in any language that the customer prefers. And so they should have the capacity uh, to be able to understand the complaints that will be submitted in whatever language that the customers would uh, prefer. So how do we do this? Uh, or how, what are the channels that, um, as a consumer, you, is available to you to submit a complaint? We're saying that you can easily walk in to submit a complaint. You can pick up a phone and call and submit a complaint. Or you can, you can, you can write if you can write and then even present it in writing. Or you can also use um, the post um, to submit uh, your complaint. Now, what we have also done is that as a customer, uh, you could use any other medium that um, a bank may also provide. So in this case, um, we have quite a number of banks coming up with very uh, um, user-friendly media. Um, it could be through their website, you can submit your complaint through emails. Uh, now there are a number of chatbots that are also coming up where you can be speaking to a robot as if it's a human being and they're very interactive where you can also submit your complaint. In, in, in. I think Mr. Kojo is having challenge with his network connection. So he has, he's gone off. Uh, I'm sure he'll be joining in any moment from now.
Okay. Okay, so uh, like this, forgive me. Yeah, I think I had an issue with my network. Please forgive me. Okay. Uh, please can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. My apologies. Um, so um, I was saying that complaints are supposed to be received. Uh, without a customer paying any any money or anything for filing a complaint. And so uh, we need to draw your attention that anytime you have an issue with a bank or a rural bank or any of the Bank of Ghana regulated institutions uh, and you submit your complaint, it should not cost you anything to file a complaint. Uh, we know that to have a complaint itself is a cost. Um, of course, you might have suffered some financial loss or emotional um, uh, um, stress, or it may be the stress for the complaint and all that. So we do not expect that in filing a complaint, you will also uh, incur additional cost um, to that. So um, uh, one of the things we've also done is that anytime you file your complaint, you should be able to receive an acknowledgement within five days after filing the complaint. Um, I think, unfortunately, for uh, a number of the banks we see, and I'm sure a number of you have also experienced it, in most cases, when you send either through email or through their uh, website, you get um, some response uh, or some immediate response. Now, what are the levels of uh, complaint resolution that the Bank of Ghana has put in place? Now, first of all, we um, request that or require that if you have a complaint against any of our institutions, you are supposed to go there first to submit your complaint. We expect that you first of all go to the institution to submit your complaint. And then once you have submitted the complaint and you are not satisfied, so they provide you a resolution, um, they have within 20 working days to provide you a resolution. If you submit your complaint today and they've received it within 20 uh, working days, they should be able to provide you a resolution. Now, if they provide you a resolution and you are not happy with that resolution, or you submitted your complaint and you did not receive any acknowledgement, or for a number of days um, within the 20 days, uh, you feel that that complaint will not be resolved to the best of your expectation, then we are saying that your next point of uh, recourse is at the Bank of Ghana. So you have every right to escalate your complaint to Bank of Ghana if you think that the resolution that it provided you was not what you expected or it was not a fair resolution that has been provided you. Now we are saying that you can proceed to Bank of Ghana to present your complaint. Now, um, Bank of Ghana will also receive uh, your complaint Complaint. Bank of Ghana would also try to resolve the complaint. And, and in this case, we do this in collaboration. We need to employ other uh, mediation. We try to bring the complainant and then so we bring you and then the bank together at a table, and then we discuss uh, where we think that the bank is wrong, we would rule. And then if you, you need to be compensated, we, we do that. If it's about your money that has to be paid back, we do that. And if we think that we do not have a case to, we we'll also explain to you why we think that you do not have a case. So we try to provide that resolution by making sure that we go according to our lay down procedures and make sure that uh, before we are done with our resolution, it's more or less a win-win uh, situation. Um, oftentimes, the, the, the banks or our institutions have said that we are, 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 are more or less um, um, are skewed towards the interest of the consumer. But um, we try our best not to do that, even though they have uh, accused us many times, that uh, TK is on, they've accused us many times. But um, we always would want to look at 
um, fairness here. Again, we, the, the institutions are also our regulated institutions. And so if we do anything that goes so much against them, um, of course, if there are issues, it will still come to the fall on back of the less uh, So in trying to do this, we rely more on arbitration, but we always would want to be fair in our resolution. Now, assuming Bank of Ghana provides you a resolution and then you are not happy with it, we are saying that you have every right to move to the law court to also uh, proceed with a resolution. And you know, nothing stops anybody from going to court. So anybody at all, if you are not happy with anything, you can go to court. So these are the procedures. However, uh, we something we often discourage, we discourage, but um, we also have to let you know that um, whilst I have said that you first of all have to go to a financial institution, in very rare cases, um, we also do receive some complaints directly from, from complainant. And we allow this because um, sometimes we know that the institution might not have even perhaps the complainant knows that the institution might not be capable of resolving that complaint. Or, and the complaint is such that the complainant cannot even have an interaction with officials of the bank. And so in those cases, uh, Bank of Ghana will still receive that complaint directly from consumers. So we do not buy you from coming directly to Bank of Ghana to complain, but it's something we also again discourage because we want you to go to them and because we believe that they have first-hand information and they should be capable of resolving your company. Now, I've highlighted that for the institutions that are regulated by Bank of Canada, TK mentioned, they have within 20 working days to resolve your complaint. It doesn't mean that if the complaint is something that they can resolve within a day, they should wait up until 20 working days. Now, let me say that for some very complex uh, complaints, if the bank thinks that uh, the complaint is, is so much, it is such complex that they will not be able to resolve it within the 20 working days, uh, they have um, um, every uh, they have a responsibility to seek additional 10 days uh, from you, the complainant. That this complaint is very complex, and I think that you should give me 10 more days. The law allows them to take additional 10 days to be able to resolve. Say the Bank of Ghana, we received this complaint from our customer, but it's so complex that we have exceeded the 20 and then 10 additional days. For that matter, we are asking that the Bank of Ghana can intervene to be able to resolve um, the complaint for, for the complainant. Now, I mentioned earlier that you have a right to come to Mark of Ghana. Uh, and, 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 and of course, if you do not receive the response, like I said, or if you are not happy with the resolutions and all that, then you can submit your, your complaints uh, or escalate the complaints to, to, to Mark of Ghana. Now, let me make this also uh, clear for us because we often um, experience that as well. Now, if a bank has provided you with a resolution and you do not um, come to Bank of Ghana uh, if you were not satisfied with the resolution, you do not come. And then you come later, I think we have about uh, 20, within 20 uh, working days, you should be able to submit your appeal. But if you wait beyond 20 working days and you submit, your appeal, Bank of Ghana may say that um, uh, may not receive that appeal because you did not go within the 20 working days. So just this is also just for our information. All right. Now there are some limitations uh, in terms of the recourse procedures within uh, the banking sector, and one of them is that. If you have um, gone to court, for instance, you have sent your complaint to court and the court is um, going into your complaint. At that point, we say that if you come back to Bank of Ghana, Bank of Ghana will not receive that complaint. So immediately you initiate a court action against a bank 
or a rural bank or a savings and loans on an issue you are not happy about. What it means is that you have to follow through the court process. You cannot have Bank of Ghana to uh, uh, mediate on your case and also have the courts do it simultaneously. So what we often say is that if you want Bank of Ghana, which in most of the cases becomes very short, then you might have to go and then, uh, um, if, if I may use the word, uh, close that case or cancel that case and bring evidence to Bank of Ghana that, well, you have stopped or you have paused, uh, sorry, the cost will not be the right word, um, you have closed that case before Bank of Ghana will try to uh, continue the case. Again, if you go to court to go and seek judgment over a complaint against the bank, and you now want enforcement of whatever uh, um, um, resolution the court provided, you can't also come to Bank of Ghana for Bank of Ghana to help you enforce that. So with that one to when you come, uh, the bank will tell you to go back to the court to seek enforcement. So we do not, we are not a court and we cannot compete with a court. So once you start any court procedures, you will definitely have to proceed to, to complete that. Now, another limitation is when the complaint had um, um, had been with you for quite a long Ghana or the bank. In this case, we are looking at three years. So if, for instance, uh, six, seven years ago, you saw that, or let's say um, now, you looked at your bank statement and then you saw that there were some deductions on your statement seven years ago. And then you think that 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 deduction on your account didn't come from you and you want to dispute it. When you go to the financial institution of Bank of Ghana, Bank of Ghana, the requirement is that that complaint is beyond six years. And for that matter, it would not be considered. And here we are looking at uh, uh, the statutory limitations uh, that have been provided in, in our statutes, uh, which is to say that banks and all all the other issues are supposed to maintain uh, data for uh, six years or within of up to six years. They can maintain of up to six years. So what it means is that it will be very difficult for us this information retrieving but will be very difficult. So please, if you have any issue with any of your bank, please immediately you identify it, draw your attention and do not wait for more than six years before you complete. Okay, so I have mentioned this, that if, it, if there's a matter before Bank of Ghana and you proceed to, 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 to court, then what it means is that we are going to stop. Uh, again, if you have, we'll have to let you withdraw the case. I've mentioned this, so let me briefly continue. Okay, so just um, some information for all of us. Um, if you have any complaint and then you want to submit to Bank of Ghana, uh, you can submit through email. We have the email as complaints.office at boj.gov.gh. You can also come to the seventh floor of City House, Accra, to submit your complaint. Or you can also submit your complaint to any of the regional offices. We have one in Sunyani, we have uh, Kumasi, Takrade, uh, Seshubapo, and then Tamale. Um, so, and then Sunyani, I think I mentioned that. So, if you have any complaint, you can also write it and submit it to all uh, uh, any of these offices, and then they'll submit it to the city house, seven floor city house, zero two uh, six six five hundred five. So that's a direct line to the complaints uh, office. We also have uh, WhatsApp. I think I didn't I didn't put the WhatsApp here, but let me quickly get it and then share with you. Um, So we also have WhatsApp, and our WhatsApp number is 059 So this is our WhatsApp line. You can also submit your complaint uh, to this WhatsApp line. So these are the procedures that uh, we have. Uh, within uh, the banking sector when you have any complaint against any of our institutions. Let me also say that um, the complaint could also be about the conduct of the institution and not necessarily the issue. So if you are having a service and then 
you are badly or poorly uh, treated, you can also submit that uh, as a complaint. Complaints are going to serve as a check for us uh, in terms of the conduct of our institution. You know, we look at their safety and their soundness and, and all that, and we do this through uh, documentation, more or less. But when it comes to the real physical conduct, we try to understand these through the complaints that are filed at the Bank of Ghana. So we entreat everybody, if you have any issue with any of our institutions, kindly draw their attention. In most cases, you realize that the issue would be uh, within the branch or the teller. And so even at the head of this, they might not know what you are complaining about. Uh, we have witnessed quite very rude uh, um, um, customer service um, 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 staff at the front line. And so you should not um, uh, um, sit back anytime you have a complaint, kindly um, escalate any of these complaints because this is what is going to uh, more or less give us some feedback as to how our institutions are conducting themselves. I, I wanted to, um, I think one of the things I wanted to highlight was on the responsible savings and investment. And I think TK had mentioned um, um, all of them, but I wanted to highlight some of the red flags. Um, red flags. Um, okay, so it's mentioned that TBOs, um, high returns is mentioned that it was one of, yeah, so I just wanted to make this point. And we often see this within uh, our sector or in Ghana here, where people put their money uh, within the institutions and then uh, they go they go to sleep. So it's an investment that you have done. And then let's let's also understand this. Uh, nobody would say that a bank or can give a hundred percent surety that a bank would not pay. Bank of Ghana cannot give any an assurance that any bank will never never fail. Banks are like any other uh, banks are like any other business that can fail. In fact, they are even riskier than any other uh, business. So what it means is that they can fail. That is why Bank of Ghana will put in a lot of uh, conditions just to make sure that they stay afloat. And and and, and Tiki mentioned some of the deposit insurance and all that. So we cannot give that hundred percent assurance. So what it means is that. You as a customer also have a responsibility. And then that responsibility should be that whenever you put your money in any of our regulated institutions, make sure you monitor that investment. How often do you call to check up on your statement? How often do you find out if your money is being or how often do you read about these institutions and what is happening uh, to them? I think earlier I wanted to. Uh, uh, share the, some of the red flags, which, um, for instance, does the institution solely depend on the CEO? For, for example, without a CEO, payments to customers cannot be made, even though the investment maturity date is due. So you have a very small uh, microfinance institution, for instance. Is it that you see that everything about the company is revolved solely around the CEO? To the extent that when you are going for your money, they tell you that, oh, please, with the CEO, I want the CEO come before uh, your money uh, will be paid. And in some cases, they will tell you that when you're your, your uh, investment is matured and you're going for it, they'll tell you that, oh, please roll over because of a lot of conditions and all that. These are some of the red flags that as a customer, immediately you see these things popping up. You should be uh, cautious and say that, okay, you need, if you were monitoring your funds every month, you need to now do that weekly so that if you can uh, take action, then you can uh, um, take action. So please do not uh, go to sleep when uh, you have uh, put your money in any of our, of our institutions. Let me also um, take the opportunity to also take you through some few things that you need to take note as a, as a customer. And I want to believe that almost all of us have one or two accounts with, uh, with our banks. And, and uh, I just highlight, some of us have checkbooks um, some of the practices that we have seen. And I'm doing this because we want to protect your interest. And um, what some of the things we've seen are the check, some of us sign our checkbooks and put it there when we are traveling, we leave it behind. And then uh, we expect that people will present them with little checks and pre signed. That is something that is a bad practice we need to stop. And then also is, uh, issuing a check to somebody when you do not have money in your account. Please 
is a criminal offense, and Bank of Ghana have very, very, very strict uh, sanctions uh, for anybody that issue a check when you do not have money in your account. You might lose uh, uh, the, the the right of operating an account in any of our any of our banks. And I think there are a few issues also about ATM cards. Again, we've seen certain things that I want to share with you. Uh, for for some of us, we may not need the the bank's beautifully branded uh, cards. Uh, the Visa card and the MasterCard, for instance, if you don't intend uh, traveling outside or you don't intend purchasing anything online, why do you need those Visa and MasterCard when you can opt for a local card that can also work with all the ATMs, which have very low charges? Okay, uh, I think they have even standard charges of two cities and all that. Why don't we opt for that and we go for um, a debit or Visa card, which is very expensive? Uh, for some of us, I'm sure that from the time we took all these cards, we have never used it to even purchase anything online. Now, some of us also use our date of birth or year of birth for our pins and all that. You know that when a friend gets hold of your ATM card, the very first thing that you think about is your, your pin, or is your date, your year of birth as your pin. So let's also avoid that and make sure that you secure your ATM cards because if anybody even take a picture of it, the front and back, you can use it to do any transaction without your knowledge. I think that for the sake of time, um, I will leave it here. And then if there's any question, I would uh, take them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Kujo. I think these are insightful presentation. And I, I already, I can see a couple of hands up. I see Mr. Mr. Kofi's hand up already. Um, Maybe we do the questions and answers, then I'll, I'll, I'll present you my summary and my key takeaway from this presentation. So, Ms. Agofi, please. Ms. Agofi, can you unmute and go ahead with your question? Um, and I'm talking from the position of a customer. I feel that it seems to me that most of the regulators that we know about that have been mentioned here today, the uh, SEC, Bank of Ghana, NPRA, and I think NIC, they seem to us to be passive more than active. And I ask this because if you take the case of um, BKM and also um, what, what uh, men's gold and so on, is it that the regulator does not have what it takes, the mandate to buy it or to prosecute, all right? Here is a case where it is so obvious that this, there's a player in the market who is not playing the, according to the rules. And what SEC does is to call the consumer's attention, please note, this man or this organization is not registered with us, so please don't deal with them. When they are duping people, they are actually taking people out, doing things that I consider criminal, and the regulator is sitting there passively, only sending messages to the, 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 the customer. Now, bearing in mind that there's a large chunk of our market, all right, where people are financially illiterate, or illiterate, I mean, it's basically illiterate, and yet they don't, we don't feel protected, all right, and so, um, and sometimes even let me even try to come to Bank of Ghana. A, a customer or somebody has a problem with his own, his own bank. I'm sure you would have heard that some of them don't even take the trouble to come and report. They feel they are incapable of fighting a financial institution because they are mere, a mere customer you know, in that sense. And so what, what stops the banks when they have seen something, even before a customer comes to make a formal complaint, what stops the regulator from stepping in to actually take action that would give me confidence in the regulator? I, I, have, a, I have a basic challenge uh, with that, that uh, regulators do not seem, and I'm using, I'm being careful with my choice of words. They don't seem to be active. They seem to be passive. And therefore, people don't seem to have that kind of confidence in them. And then we sit back and so many people are due, and it becomes like a, a government uh, responsibility 
to solve the problem. But we have institutions in place that have that responsibility, in my estimation, to be taking up those fights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kofi. I think that, that's a point well made. We will take a couple of two more questions, if there are any, for Mr. Kofi to respond to all of them at once. So if there are any more questions. All right, Mr. Kujo, please, you can go ahead with the response for Mr. Kofi's question. He is saying regulators are seen to be rather passive than active as in we wait for things to happen before we, we step in. Your response, please. Okay, I think, um, first of all, let me say that um, I'm trying to create an analogy here. Um, everybody, I, I mean, most people know that driving on the shoulder of, uh, of a road is an offense. Um, even with the police around, um, people still do it. Okay, and I'm not sure that will stop today. People will continue to drive on the shoulder, even in the presence of the police, until the police see them. Then, of course, they can be arrested. So, um, similarly, I mean, we have people who are always uh, they know that some actions are are illegal, but they will try to to do this, and I'm sure that. that this will also not be the end within the financial sector. We'll have these people coming up every day, and then, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll keep coming. So that is why we have taken upon ourselves to rather empower the consumer so that you would understand what they do, so that once you see them, you clearly would know that this is a fraudulent um, activity. And so if all of us are enlightened about it, their actions will not even be fruitful. Now, I haven't said that, um, I think that what we have done in the past is to alert customers when we see some of these things. Um, I would say that for the, for the ones that probably an action has not been taken for you to see, um, probably the, these guys will be working uh, underground. Nobody knows where. Um, and you only see them with them. I'm sure you are, you are aware of it. You are this. It goes back to men's group by Bank of Ghana, and they were doing certain things that were seen to be uh, uh, more or less a Ponzi scheme. Those when they were identified were closed. But men's group, for instance, um, in my view, they were more or less uh, taking advantage of, uh, let me call it a regulatory arbitrage, where they found a loophole and probably um, every, 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 the regulators were trying to find out, okay, so which of the law is this gentleman uh, breaching so that an action will be taken. But even before that, the regulators kept warning people that please, we do not think that this is a viable business. And so please do not enter. So my, 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 my final comment on that would be that let us look at empowering these people or empowering ourselves because these things will keep coming. But as and when we see a clear deposit taking institution without a license, for that one, we rest assured that they'll be closed down and then they're prosecuted. Uh, All right, thank you, Mr. Kujo. Um, we have a couple of comments in the chat box. We have Kevin Elikem saying that some years back, before investing with capital and more microfinance, I placed a call with UG and Capital Bank. I thought I was doing my due, due diligence. Long story short, capital and more was affected by the issues that happened some years back. Luckily, because capital bank and more was registered with POG. I didn't lose my money. So I side with Mr. Kofi. The regulators must also up their game, just as consumers are to be careful. We also have a question from Samuel Azuma. Samuel is asking that, what is your thought on cryptocurrency? 
what is your thoughts on cryptocurrency? Initially, we had Bismarck saying that the six years is too short a time for the complaint. He, Mr. Kujo indicated that after six years of a particular issue, you cannot make complaints on it. And he indicated that six years was too short. But we had a response from Mr. Chunibu Akujo saying that the six years is for specific acts, which includes simple contracts like that with banks. The limitations of acts, with the limitation of the Act of Ghana, Section 4, I think Bank of Ghana Act, Section 4, but after six years, one, Actions bad after six years are one. A person shall not bring an action after the expiration of six years from the date on which the cause of action accrued. In the case of A, an action founded on thought other than an action to which sections two and three apply. An action founded on simple contracts. C, an action founded on quasi contracts. And D, an action to enforce a recognizance. We also had a question also from Bismarck again, asking that can one make a verbal complaint? So from the chat box, Mr. Kofi, Mr. Kujo, we have two questions. The first one is, what is your thoughts on cryptocurrency? And then the other is, can one make verbal complaints to, I think the Bank of Ghana or the financial institution involved? Okay. Okay, so I think going through the chat, I've also seen uh, somebody correcting my point out there. Thank you very much for the correction so so thank you for um, publications on on the on the regulated stance on crypto i'm saying that the ghana city still remains the the legal um, tender um, and, and nothing else uh, but i think that we have also highlighted the fact that the bank is moving into um, its own crypto uh, currency and we have actually published a policy document on that. And um, I think we've also actually started a piloting in very remote areas, trying to see how it will work uh, on the offline. So very soon, um, uh, more information on this will be, will be out there. But in terms of, I'm sure you're making reference to the Bitcoin and all the others. Um, as we speak, it is not a legal activity. Um, and the only currency that we should be using for our transactions is, is the Ghana, Ghana city. Now, in terms of the verbal complaint, I think I mentioned that, yes, you can place a phone call or you can visit uh, any of our, our offices or even with the financial institutions, you can visit them to submit your complaint um, verbally. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I think all too soon we are, we've come to the end of our session, but a quick takeaway from Mr. Kujo's presentation. I think for me, one, he said the POG has a recourse mechanism, recourse procedure to get our complaints resolved. That is the first thing I think everyone needs to know. And it is also important to know that complaints are free. Reporting your complaints to the Bank of Ghana or any other institu the institution involved is free. And when these complaints are being are lodged, it is our right to receive acknowledgement within five days. Again, the financial institution involved is the first point of call to make a complaint. And the Bank of Ghana, if we are unsatisfied with the resolution we get from the institution, later to the courts. With the Bank of Ghana and the financial institution involved, they have 10 days each to resolve the complaints that have been um, lodged with them. It's also important to note that when an, a court action is issued on a particular complaint, the Bank of Ghana will not accept unless it is being truncated at the court, as they will not want to um, be battling or be fighting the court in any way, for lack of better words. As a key takeaway for financial we say don't go to sleep after saving or investing. It is important for us to monitor our investments or savings from time to time to know how well they are doing. So I think Mr. Kojo admonished us to be taking our bank statement, be reading about the financial institution we've actually saved with, to know what is happening with them. I mean, and easy, we can even look at their bank statements and all that if you have the capability to read them, I think it is important. He also cautioned us of transacting businesses with institutions who solely depend on CEO to transact 
uh, business, I think it is a red flag and it's an indication of troubles ahead of us. For those of us having current accounts, it is a criminal offense to issue checks where we know we do not have money in the account. For ATMs and for cards that we use, with the ATM cards and then those debit and credit cards, Ms. Akujo is admonishing us to rather use the local cards than the international cards, which are try high charges. If we have local cards like GH Link and the others, and understand the charges on these ones are lower compared to the charges on the international ones. So if you are not going to travel or you're not traveling with your card, it is important you use the domestic ones for us to, for you to be able to make some savings on um, on, on, on those fees. So I think I would thank, I'd like to first of all thank Ms. Akujo and Ms. Atunebu Akudia for these insightful presentations. And I will at this point invite Mr. Um, Prosper Ibuano to give us the closing remarks. Right, and I think, uh, right. Thank you, um, Saki, for a good moderating of these sessions. Um, today, Saturday, indeed, has been well spent. And um, like someone said early on, I want to thank uh, Mr. Goffrey Kujo and Mr. Tunibu Akudia Bwachi. I wish we met in person and we can give some serious handshakes to actually mean um, that uh, we are much grateful for the time you spent with us. Um, financial education is very critical. We know that, unfortunately, in, 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 in the country, the education have not, is not well entrenched. People are not well exposed to the information we are exposed to today. We wish we had about 300 people on this call to carry the message on to others. Um, we all on this call can also bear with me that um, it is only in few cases that people get to know this information in a classroom setting. Mostly you have to, you, you are out of school, you make a lot of financial mistakes before you get to know these things. And so I thank, I'm very grateful that we are able to know these informations at the early stages of our career of our lives. Um, to continue with that also, I would want to also thank uh, the country director, Mr. Kofi for spending time with us. I would also, I mean, um, also want to thank um, the executive director, Emerging Public Leaders, um, uh, Ms. Yawa Hansen, who joined us and uh, uh, um, had to attend to other activities and so dropped off along the way. But uh, we are very much grateful to, uh, to, to her for uh, making time to join us in this webinar. And uh, Mr. Kofi also for, I mean, your remark at the beginning, and uh, it tells how ready you were yourself to learn. And so if Mr. Kofi is learning, we the young ones have no, um, um, we, we have no excuse then also to learn alongside. I would also want to thank the representatives from uh, Office of the Head of Civil Service, uh, Madam Elizabeth, who joined us, and every other person whom I have not mentioned, those who joined us across and from other countries, those um, who are not who are not um, EPLAN members, who are not either not EPL members, but join on this call. We are very much grateful. In fact, this is a public uh, webinar, and we are grateful that you you, you made time. to join the webinar. Um, as, um, as a notice to all of us on this call, um, ePlan, you might not know about ePlan, so I just want to take this about two minutes just to talk about ePlan, which is an Emerging Public Leaders Alumni Network. Emerging Public Leaders itself is a two-year fellowship program that intends to draw young people from uh, graduates into the public service to do a two-year fellowship. And then later on, you serve in the public service as, as, as officers. And so after your two year uh, fellowship, you would, you would graduate and become an alum, an, an alum. And so we have an alumni network and uh, we focus on providing mentorship, guidance to current fellows to enable them to be successful in their placements. And so every other public servant, if you have interest in ePlan, the doors are open out to you. And we also look to continually assist our members in the network 
in elevating um, their um, uh, their capacity, their capacity to their institutions. And so, among other things, uh, we 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 look out for we look out to do as ePlan. And so, it is very important. This program program falls right within um, our, our aims and objectives as a network. And so we we are really grateful you joined us and also you spent time. I saw people that were actively asking questions and all that. Um, and uh, there is one good news for all of us on this call. If you are a public, if you serve in a public service, any of the public service institutions, ePlan is open for you to join. ePlan accepts um, associate members. And if you want to join, it is open for you to join. I would like to put our email out there. If you have any questions, you can send an email within 24 hours. Um, the secretary of the network would um, uh, respond to you. And so the, e the email to um, the network is eplan at emergingpublicleaders.org. Eplan at emergingpublicleaders.org. That is the email. If you have any inquiries to make, you can shoot us a mail. The secretary will respond to you and then we'll take it from there. I feel this workshop has been very useful. And as part of our activities for 2021, we would be looking at a lot more similar activities, which would be very important to your career progress. It doesn't matter whether you're in a public service or wherever you find yourself every activity we, we plan doing as ePlan would be very useful to you. And so I just want to mention that as part of this financial series, it's not just a one-off activity. There will be other uh, topics we'll be discussing in, in, in the bracket of financial literacy. There are, we, we also have in plan to, um, to actually have some outreaches in schools, and uh, yes, so if if you, you should look out for us on the EPL or EPL social media platforms, uh, we will get back to you. We'll get back to you when there are other activities and we hope that you join us. There are other webinars, which we hope to youth led. I mean, youth led webinars, which will be very useful to your career progress. And so uh, we are looking out to do all these things. And so wherever you are, look out for us on the EPL, uh, Emerging Public Leaders social media, platforms you can like you can follow all the platforms on twitter so, um, instagram facebook any activity you have we have you will hear from us from there and then we will take uh, we'll continue our relation and our learning process from there as well and so i want to also thank you in person for making time for this webinar making time to share with us i mean your questions most of us did not ask questions but what a few of us that asked the question actually helped others to understand the topic better. So I would want to thank you all for spending your two over two hours with us. Actually, it has been very fruitful. And so, um, uh, moderator, I would like you to take it from here. Thank you so much for for leading this uh, discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prosper. Thank you very much. Um, I think we. We will, we will invite Vasco Avocat to give us the closing prayer. But before we do that, we would like us to, those in a very good place, on our videos for just 30 seconds, for us to take e-photos of this program. And then from there, Vasco will give us the closing prayer. So sure. let's just put on our video for just 10 seconds if you're in a very good area. And Justin, please, let me know when you're done with the e-photo. Thank you for putting on their videos. Imam, you're not smiling. Okay. Jan, they say those who are at a good place. Jan, your place is not good. Please put off your video okay. better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Vasco, please give us a closing prayer. <laughs> All right, let's pray. We pray in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We thank you. Lord, Almighty, we thank you for the protection and guidance you've given to us through this program. 
Lord Father Almighty, this event today is by no coincidence, but Lord Father Almighty, a day that you have blessed and granted upon to us that we shall hold this discussion as a family, as a community, for the good of the Ghanaian people and the world at large. Lord Father Almighty, we thank you for the lives and the blessings upon the lives of our facilitators and presenters for today's session. And Lord, we pray that, that you may grant them wisdom and knowledge and they may continue to inspire and impact on our generation and beyond. And whatever knowledge, Lord Father Almighty, that we have gathered here today, Lord, that we shall put it into good use for our own benefit and the benefit of the good people and beyond. Lord, we are living here, but we are not living in your presence. We pray that you will continue to guide and protect us, Lord, and see us through. And at the end of the day, we would continue to glorify and worship your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And we will meet again. Thank you. Thank you for cooperating with us too. We didn't have much.